The doubt and I began our short trek towards the barracks. As we approached the outer gate, I heard a slight hum, similar to when the doubt absorbed the battery energy. Great, the fence must be electrified. So much for my sneak through the gate plan. The doubt did not seem phased by this and poised himself, ready to drain energy from the gate. The hum coming from the doubt's erect fur was now louder than what was coming from the gate. I did not know how effectively drained the gate's power was, nor could I afford to spend time gauging it. I took this opportunity to cut a hole into the gate with my sword just big enough for the doubt and I to pass through. The doubt staggered through the gap, and once we were through, the doubt returned a fair portion of the energy back to the gate. He held some voltage in reserves, just in case. Even though he had just learned how to essentially become a walking transistor not 20 minutes ago, the doubt already seemed rather adept at controlling the extra energy surging through his body. We cleared the fence and hid behind the closest building we had access to. Now that we were in the facility, I urged the doubt to get in contact with his kinsmen within the barracks to provide some directions through the facility. He closed his eyes and began to meditate. A few seconds later, the doubt opened his eyes. She has given me the layout to the facility, though she is unsure where in the facility your son is. What do you mean? How could she not know where he is if she's the one who said my son was here? Relax, he's still in the facility, but was recently moved to a new room shielded from our mental abilities and she is unsure where they took him. I see. Did she at least map out where the control room was? At least then we could access the surveillance systems and find him that way. Yes, the control room is located on the second floor of the center tower on the opposite side of the building. Alright, when we see a break in the foot patrol's routine, we will rush for the tower. I chambered around in the silenced pistol and readied myself to run for the building. Before committing too much to this bold strategy, I asked the doubt if there were any cameras monitoring the grounds. The doubt replied that there was one that we would need to worry about. It was located just above the door to the control tower. I aimed my gun and took a shot at the light some 13 meters away. I missed. I tried two more shots before giving up. Apparently, it had been too long since I was at the gun range and I decided to conserve what ammunition I could. Try one more time. I will assist you. I aimed my pistol one more time. When looking down the iron sights, the camera appeared a lot closer this time, almost to the point where I could poke it if I took a step or two forward. This must have been the aid that the doubt was referring to. I pulled the trigger, and saw the camera begin to spark, confirming that I had disabled it. Once the ground troops had temporarily cleared to switch shifts, the doubt and I darted for the door to the control room's tower. We made it to the door with no incident. I carefully opened the door, and much to my surprise, nobody seemed to be here. There was a lounge area, a small kitchen, and even a small computer lab but no evidence of anyone using it in recent memory. Almost as if the soldiers were going out of their way to avoid this building on purpose. After surveying the first floor, the doubt and I began climbing the stairs to the second floor. There was still not even a dull murmur of conversation within the tower. Despite this, I remained vigilant. We reached the top of the stairwell, only to find several bodies lying on the ground. We examined one of the bodies and noticed a rather prominent hole in their stomach, their right leg dislocated, 
and their left arm torn from its socket. The doubt examined another body killed in a similar manner, except this one had its eyes gouged out, and their right leg was gone. I looked around for a source of light and eventually found a light switch. There were two additional soldiers lying on the ground, both missing extremities. The floor in that room was caked in dried blood. Whatever did this did not appear to do so to feed, but to collect trophies of sorts for sport. Now that the lights were on, the doubt and I scanned the other rooms, but could not find anything. In doing so, I stumbled upon a locked door with a faint glow coming through the underside of it. Thankfully, the door swung out into the hallway, and I was able to access the door's hinges. I popped the hinges utilizing an adjacent screwdriver, revealing the monitors of the control room. Aside from the electrical equipment, there was a lone figure in the room, standing in front of the terminal. It had a long trench coat on, with a wide-brimmed fedora hat. It began to turn around and I noticed that it had no defining features. That is, until I saw the eyes. The eyes appeared to be those stolen from the soldier in the hallway, as they were ever wide and constantly beaming. Whatever this creature was, I was fairly certain that it had killed everyone on this floor and that some brave soul was able to corner it into this room. It began to raise its right hand and walk toward me, as if longing for part of me to become part of it. I reached for my gun, but seeing as how its anatomy was composed of other people, I did not know what would be a lethal shot. I tried the raised hand. The creature did not even stagger, and there was no sense that I harmed the creature either. I then shot it where the human heart would reside. This appeared to have significantly more effect, but I was unsure as to why. I took a third shot at its head, right between its borrowed eyes. The creature shrieked and collapsed on the floor. On closer examination of the creature, it appeared that it was wearing the limbs, almost like gloves and boots. What was weird about this was that it did not seem to have its own arms and legs, but was more like a blob that could manipulate the limbs by forcing portions of itself into the limbs' blood vessels. If that was true, why was my quote unquote headshot so effective. Watch out! No sooner had he said this than the amorphous figure seemed to spring back to life. Apparently playing possum was part of this creature's combat strategy. Seeing as how my gun was effectively useless against it, I holstered my pistol and drew my sword. <laughs> With a powerful downward slash, the creature was split right down the middle. Both halves now lay on the ground, but after seeing its earlier ruse, I looked for a way to confirm it was dead. You ain't getting back up again. With this, the doubt began to shock the creature with its stored electricity. Doing so made the blob begin to boil, and it evaporated away. The resulting smell was a mix of seared meat and skunk spray. After shocking the creature, we progressed toward the monitors to find out where my son may have been taken. I switched from camera to camera until I found him. According to the feed, he was in a building off to the left of the control tower by about three meters. Hold on, son. Daddy's here.
The Suburban Samurai, a radio drama written and narrated by Don Rosenberger, also starring Jake Hilty as The Doubt. The music used in this episode of Suburban Samurai was composed by Bobby Prince, Dope, and Nobu Oimatsu.